So I'm reading David Stahel's book, The Battle for Moscow, referring to the 1941 battle as Germany tried to uh, capture Moscow. Stahel has the, the best reviewed articles, uh, best reviewed books on Operation Barbarossa on the Amazon website. He's an Australian military historian. And a couple of weeks ago, I read his book on Operation Barbarossa, which concentrated on the first two months of the war. And uh, I contrast it with, uh, I think it was Russell Stolfi wrote a book called Hitler's Panzers East around 1996, which argued that if Germany had simply marched on Moscow in July 1941, it, it would have won World War II. So Stahel, by contrast, said that uh, Germany never had any chance of conquering the Soviet Union. They simply did not have the men, the machines, the logistics, just did not have the raw ability to conquer the Soviet Union. Never did, so no strategy mattered. Uh, no, no brilliant tactics mattered. In the final analysis, they were just always going to be worn down by the campaign. And so the battle for Moscow portrays a German army uh, throwing its last reserves into the battle to try to take Moscow. And the German army leadership faced a choice in November of 1941. They could try to set up winter quarters and conserve their strength, or they could give everything to the offensive. The challenge they were facing is that as every day went by, the Soviet Union was growing stronger uh, compared to Germany because it simply had more people, more industrial power. So that's why the situation was so desperate. Germany had only a chance to win a fast war. They weren't going to be able to win a long sustained war. And so Germany was driving on Moscow in November 1941 uh, with its leadership very much thinking about how in 1914 following the Schlieffen plan uh, Germany was driving on Paris and was stopped just short of Paris so Germany appeared to be driving for the win in 1914 and uh, a lot of the German officers learned from that experience that uh, Germany should have thrown its last reserves into that battle to take Paris and to, to win World War I, but that they were too cautious. So this time they didn't want to be cautious, so they throw their last reserves into the battle for Moscow. And uh, they, get, they get within about 20 miles of Red Square, about 25 miles of, of Red Square. but. Uh, the Soviet Union is holding back all these, like, five armies in reserve uh, for a counteroffensive, And uh, Germany is just absolutely spent. So they were able to roll up to the outskirts, the suburbs of Moscow, but they had no chance of surrounding Moscow, and uh, they had no chance of actually conquering Moscow. So, in the literature, this, the Battle for Moscow is referred to as a decisive event in World War II, or like Germany was on the verge of seizing Moscow, but heroic defensive efforts by the Soviet Union uh, managed to stop Germany. Uh, in reality, Germany was all tuckered out. They, they pushed about as far as they could and uh, they threw their final reserves in to, to get within about 25 miles of Moscow and uh, they were done. That, that was as far as they, they were going to get. So 
Just thinking about Stahill's overall approach to Operation Barbarossa and how he, he uh, does the statistics, points out the differences in manpower and tanks and in, in, uh, aircraft, uh, that, uh, that Germany never had a chance. It just reminds me of the limitations we all face in life, right? We can be brilliant we can be skillful we might even have unique skills but uh, we're all we're, we're all operating in a matrix okay where there's only so much human freedom wow this is a reckless driver just making a lot of reckless. Who's that idiot? Huh. Looks like some Latino guy in his 40s. Maybe he's intoxicated. He's a terrible driver up in front of me. So we're, we all face constraints. If you've got kids, you're faced with a constraint that your number one priority has to be to provide and protect for your family. And if you have 105 IQ, you're never going to graduate college. If you have an IQ up to 110, you're never going to become a doctor or a lawyer. At 115, IQ is the absolute minimum for becoming a doctor or a lawyer. And if you're competing against people with uh, higher IQs, they're simply going to have a superior cognitive firepower. So, uh, it's, it's just really important to to see yourself accurately, to see other people accurately. That's that's humility living in reality. Reality was that, that Germany never had a chance to uh, defeat the Soviet Union in World War Two. And so what are, what are some painful realities that we all have to face? I'm, okay, I'm 52 years of age. The painful reality is that uh, I'll probably never have children. Uh, never been particularly entrepreneurial. So sure, I could, I could uh, learn skills, but uh, the painful truth is I'm probably better off as an employee than as an employer. What's that, that line in uh, Cool Hand Luke? A man has to know his, his limitations. Uh, I was able to make a living as a writer from 1997 to 2007, but uh, my living was largely dependent on my ability to get access. So Tom Wolfe, the journalist and the novelist, talks about this. When he was younger, he thought that uh, great writing was 80% craft and 20% material. And then as he got older, he realized that great writing was 70% material and 30% craft. So as a, as a writer, someone who's making his living as a writer, my living depended not primarily on my ability to craft stories. My living depended primarily on my ability to get access to where things were going on, where people could give me compelling information. Uh, the size of my audience for my video streams primarily depends upon the people who I have on my show. Okay, if I, if I had Donald Trump on my show, I'd, I'd get tens of thousands of views. If I got Richard Spencer on my show, I'd have 400 live views. Uh, Greg Johnson, I'll get 200 live views. And so I can think, I can plan, I can prepare. I can develop my own craft, 
but in the f final analysis, the size of my audience just uh, largely depends on the people I'm talking to on the stream. It doesn't primarily come down to the craft of what I am saying and what I'm doing. It's the compelling nature of my guests and co-hosts and people on the panel. And also in the context of what's going on in the wider world. So Saturday night, I just turned on my phone, started stream streaming extemporaneously, and uh, very quickly there were you know, 70, 80, 90, 100 people in the stream, viewers, because of the events of Saturday morning in Pittsburgh, the synagogue massacre. And so Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, my my viewership was basically double. And with that, the, the money that I made was basically double. So this was conditioned by an external event. It wasn't because I suddenly became so much more skilled and eloquent and compelling and entertaining and... No, uh, it was simply an outside event. Uh, drove more people to my stream because they were interested in, uh, in my stream given my life history. Uh, given the things I've talked about when combined with this external event. So at, uh, at any time there, there could be some other external event that I might have some level of expertise in or have have a qualified opinion that people may find interesting. But again, these are these are things uh, these are things external to me. So, of course, I have an effect on the quality of my own streams. But uh, the outside world has a pretty big effect too. And there's a nasty, nasty accident that's just happened. Wow, on Pico Boulevard outside Fox Studios. But looks like a four car accident. So, I, th I think it's important to have a realistic understanding of, of our place in life, what our skills are, and how much of a difference we can make in certain circumstances. For example, no matter what you or I do, you know, we're never going to, uh, singularly, we're never going to uh, sway the results of the midterm elections. Uh, on the other hand, our efforts are not insignificant. We can, we can perhaps sway a, a few votes, right? But uh, the midterm elections are going to go on, and uh, we're not going to be able to determine what happens the midterm elections. You may be strongly dedicated to the white ethno state, but you, the individual, is not going to be able to bring about a white ethno state in the United States of America. Uh, on the other hand. Look what Donald Trump did. He was an individual who, first of all, mounted a hostile takeover of the Republican Party, then won the general election, and uh, was governed with a reasonable amount of success, and virtually nobody expected him to be able to do this. But Donald Trump must have had some inkling of his ability to do this. And also, there were the circumstances that uh, he put himself in. So yeah, there's a saying, you can't fight City Hall. But uh, depending on what kind of information you have, and what kind of audience you can get, and depending on, uh, on how compelling you can, you can frame it, uh, you can have a, a tremendous effect as an individual. So, as a, as a blogger who is making my living blogging, uh, my success largely depended on access and the information that people would give me or allow me to see. So uh, the biggest story I ever broke was about uh, Mark Wallace infecting, being the likely cause of uh, HIV infection going around to about a dozen porn stars in 1997, 1998. So some of that I ferreted out on my own, I was able to spot patterns and uh, I was able to dig up history on Mark Wallace, but also a large part of it was simply 
uh, just given to me by people in the industry who were concerned about what was going on. And almost all my big scoops have had probably the major characteristic of my biggest scoops as a blogger being that they were given to me. I remember uh, a columnist at the Los Angeles Daily News called me up uh, to interview me for, for a column he wanted to write about me. And in the course of that, he mentioned that uh, LA's mayor, Antonio Villaragosa, had been going around in public for about nine months without wearing a wedding ring, and nobody in the news media wanted to cover it. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And then uh, we just proceeded on to his interview of me. And while he was interviewing me, I sent that information that he'd given me to several writers in the know about the mayor. And when I got back multiple confirmations, I posted it on my blog. Okay, within about uh, 20 minutes of hearing it, uh, even while I was being interviewed, even in the course of while I was still being interviewed, I, I posted on my blog what became the biggest story in California in 2007, and uh, it effectively meant the end of uh, the mayor's political ambitions. And at the time, he was seen as a future governor of California and a presidential candidate for the Democratic Party. And in the course of this uh, trivial interaction, which I've just described, I ended his political career. Uh, and now this isn't because I'm so amazing, but I was just in a position to talk to someone with a lot more knowledge of Los Angeles politics than I had. He happened to mention something offhand. I immediately recognized it as a great story. And I also recognized that the Los Angeles news media would not want to break such a story about their prized Latino mayor of Los Angeles. So I spotted a, an opening. I did the journalistic work to confirm the information and boom, I had a blog item which the Los Angeles Times replied to about three days later with the mayor vigorously denying uh, what I had posted on my blog and then the story just kept spiraling and the mayor was, was shown to be a liar. So yeah, little old Luke with a little blog just simply while being interviewed for a profile can uh, can get a great story, which can turn out to be, say, the number one story in California in 2007. But uh, so it's important to have a sense of what you can achieve, what your talents are, uh, and uh, what your limitations are. A man's got to know his limitations. So it's very hard to make a living as a blogger. Okay, I basically gave that up in 2007 and started streaming. And uh, yeah, if I threw myself into streaming full time, I could very possibly uh, approach making a living as a streamer, but it'd be very difficult. Making a living as a YouTuber is very challenging, uh, very perilous because you could get a YouTube strike at, at any time. And I don't blame YouTube for the idea of uh, putting strikes on people for monitoring content. It's, it's a platform that's been losing money. They need to retain advertisers and uh, goodwill in the public. And if some damaging article is going to come out in the Wall Street Journal saying that, that YouTube is enabling hate, that is bad for business. So it's not just about me and what I want, my maximum freedom of expression. I operate in the matrix of all these other competing interests, and so it, it uh, pays to live in reality.